everybody in okay Go ahead. um maybe paul let's record it like i don't want all the chit chat at the beginning to be recorded okay so, you can edit it out uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just pause it okay where, where is he i don't see a or are we already in two panels there Not yes two panels Austin, babe Rao, there we go hello <laughs> I'd like to say hello to David Cobb. David Cobb was in Athens, Ohio some years ago with Move to Amend, gave some wonderful talks. Yes, I'd like to say hello too. <laughs> <laughs> hello, John. Hello, Howard. It's so good to see both of you. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Howard, Howard is in the house. I'm in the house. That's right. <laughs> Fortunately. Okay, we got a lot of our, our own people, and probably you guys recognize your people. Um, Bo Young, you'll just give the, the starting shot. Uh, whenever you're ready, Hobart. Well, I'm not, because I was not ready for this uh, task. <laughs> <laughs> David, David, why don't you just start? Yeah, it is. No, I'll give a little introduction there. Uh, uh, folks, welcome to our monthly, uh, but this one is a snap uh, coffee house with the Alliance for Just Money. Uh, my name is Hovert Schuller, and um, I'm the director of sorts uh, of this great club of people. Um, Tonight we have David Kopp and Debbie Notkin as uh, our guests, and they will talk to us about, as far as I know, uh, developments in California about public banking and, um, of course, the virtues or not of public banking. Uh, I, I, I say welcome to everybody that, that is here for the first time, and I don't know if these are people that came through us or came from uh, David and Debbie, but uh, we'll sort it out. Um, the person who would have done the introduction is not here because he made the mistake that uh, uh, we started at uh, Central Time, six o'clock instead of seven o'clock. So um, he might suddenly show up, but assuming they will be in full force then. So without further ado, thank you, Debbie Notkin and David Kopp to, uh, to come uh, at our coffee house. And the floor is yours. Again, we'll do this in a very relaxed way. So you, you just set the tone and the pace. Thank you very much, Holbert. And thank you to the Alliance for Just Money. My name is David Cobb. Uh, I know many of you, uh, <clears throat> the way I describe myself is that I am a revolutionary. Now, I'm a nonviolent revolutionary, but I am absolutely a revolutionary. And, and I always like to start conversations and where I introduce myself by saying that for two very important reasons. First, uh, because it's true. Uh, I'm a revolutionary because I believe our current systems, our social, political, and economic systems are fundamentally racist they're fundamentally sexist, they're fundamentally class oppressive, and as if that's not bad enough, uh, these systems and the transnational corporations who actually control political economy are literally gonna destroy the planet that we depend upon for life itself. So I think it's important to actually name for myself that my, my uh, desire, uh, my, my, my deep belief that we must restructure society. The second reason I name myself as a peaceful revolutionary is that I'm trying to normalize that conversation. I think that most people in their hearts and in their heads know that the current systems are fundamentally wrong uh, and that there needs to be those levels of changes. And by normalizing the idea that it's not only possible uh, that, and not only that we have the right to do it, but I argue that we have the responsibility to do it because I genuinely believe that we are living in a conjuncture, a moment where the entire ecological and economic crisis or crises are converging together to create a political crisis 
that is literally the reason that fascism is erupting all across the planet. So my effort to frame this is to say, I step into this space with humility and confidence. Uh, humility, because I know everybody on this call already knows a hell of a lot more than I do about monetary policy. Uh, and for many of you, I have the great pleasure of having worked with you during the democracy convention. Uh, many of you were panelists and presenters and the precursor to the Alliance for Just Money, the American Monetary Institute, was actually an anchor organization of the Democracy Convention. Uh, you did an entire track on monetary policy, helped me to think and understand about the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy. So in, in a sense, this is a bit of a homecoming for me. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Since that time, I have also gotten involved with work for the public banking movement. Uh, and that's why, and I'll be uh, passing very quickly uh, to my colleague, uh, Debbie Notkin, who will talk a little bit about that. But my whole point is to frame this around, we know, and y'all know, that we have got to actually address money and monetary policy in this country. Uh, I believe that we have to actually democratize the entire economy. Uh, that means not only the financial sector, it also means our workplaces, our housing. You see, uh, I do work on the local level with a group called Cooperation Humble, a local organization that is dedicated to proving that we can meet all our needs to not just survive, but to thrive, to live rich and meaningful lives without exploiting or oppressing anyone, without allowing anybody to exploit or oppress us, and that that can be done not merely in an ecologically sustainable way, but in a truly regenerative way, that we can actually re-indigenize and get back to the way all of us and our, correction, the way all of our ancestors once lived in right relationship with each other and in right relationship with the ecosystem uh, in which we li they lived. So, I have a local experiment called Cooperation Humboldt. I will ask over to make sure that in the, uh, in the, in the packet that goes out later, that that is included if folks are interested in it. But for me, I want to just share why on a very broad level, uh, I am so interested in public banking because I recognize broadly that public banking is a way of doing banking that actually prioritizes the public interest rather than the private interest, because that's really the definition, right? Uh, th what is the definition of public banking? Banking owned and operated by and for the public interest. And I'll let Debbie get into some of the specifics around what we've done in California, the efforts to build on that momentum. She'll even talk about some of the na national public banking effort. But my point in the overall opening frame is to remember that public banking is in alignment with the uh, Alliance for Just Money. Uh, I know that there are some debates still between the mo mon modern monetary theory and the Alliance for Just Money. I believe that public banking is a way to do banking that is in alignment with your philosophy. And we are looking for ways that we can collaborate together uh, to have banking done before we have to take over the entire system. And that I think is something that I'll end on. Public banking is a non-reformist reform. It is a concrete policy that can be won right now uh, and can begin to democratize the economy and to begin to, to help people to educate uh, and to move in the direction that I believe the Alliance for Just Money wants us to move in. And with that, I will pass it to my colleague, Debbie Notkin. Dave, David is a hard act to follow. Um, I'll, just, I'll just start by saying that. I had not um, anticipated quite so uh, stirring an introduction and, and I feel stirred by what David said. So let me try to put myself in some context also I got involved in public banking, 
I had been involved in some things that were somewhat related, but it was shortly after Trump was elected. And I felt the desperate need to work on something I could build and not spend my whole time working on things that we had to destroy. Um, and so that's really where I came to public banking. And as I came to it, I came to, dis to believe that economic justice and the democratization of the economy is a cl a, as clean as you can get a way for white people to work on racial justice. Um, so those, those are the two things that, that bring me to this particular movement. I don't know as much about the Alliance for Just Money as David does. He's, he feels like he's returning home. I feel like I'm visiting a new space and I have a lot to learn as well as maybe some things to teach. I know a little bit about modern monetary theory, um, but not as much as I would need to. But I wanna reiterate what David said, that public banking in general is a way of thinking about money and in particular, but not only public money, tax money, fee money, public revenue, as money that should be used for the public good. In the current system, virtually all public money is funneled into the Wall Street banks because they're the only banks that can handle the, the banking requirements of cities and counties. And the Wall Street banks are legally required to maximize profit for their shareholders they have no controls to keep them from investing in fossil fuels or private prisons or weapons or anything else. So your money that you pay in taxes, my money that I pay in taxes is not only going to things that the government does that we don't like, it's also going to things that the government's banks do that we don't like and don't support. And it's being funneled away from the things we need in our communities. In California, we always talk about affordable housing and wildfire mitigation. Wherever you are, you know what the issues are more than I do, but you know there are things that you would rather see your tax dollars go to than, uh, fossil, than fossil fuel extraction. I, I, I feel safe saying that. So in California in particular, we had an extraordinary success in 2019. And that was the passage of a passage and signature of a bill called AB 857, the Public Banking Act. And let me say before I describe the bill that this bill was passed in one session with no lobbyists, and no, effectively no money. And to say shoestring is to make it sound like a bigger budget than we had. And we did it entirely on grassroots power and conviction and you know the benefits of having a relatively liberal slash progressive state legislature in California. Uh, what the Public Banking Act does is it sets up a pathway for California cities, counties, and regions to form their own public banks. So what's a public bank? There are public banks all over the world. Um, overall, they hold something like 25 or 30% of all the money in the world. Some of the best known ones are in Germany where they have funded the Green Revolution, in Costa Rica, in India, in Vietnam, there are many, many countries with public banks. But in the United States, the only public bank of any consequence is the Public Bank of North Dakota, which some of you may have heard of. This is bank is 101 years old. It was founded as a semi-radical move by grain farmers in North Dakota who resented the, the fact that their grain was going to Minnesota and more profits were going to the Minnesota middlemen than to the grain farmers. But the reason that it passed is that the powers that be were afraid they would get real outright socialism if they didn't accept the Public Bank of North Dakota proposition, it was a compromise. 
101 years later, it's an extremely profitable operation. North Dakota had the least impact of any state in the country from the 2008 financial crisis. It also did the best job of any state in the country of distributing the Paycheck Protection Act, uh, Paycheck Protection Plan money to small businesses. And these are, I, I could show you statistics on this if this was a more formal uh, operation. On the other hand, North Dakota is a red state. It's a conservative state. The Bank of North Dakota also bankrolled the attacks on Standing Rock. So what, how good is a public bank? It's as good as the public that's behind it. In California, we have very real hopes that in a, in a at least so-called progressive state that we can build public banks that really do represent the public interest. Uh, AB 57 banks will handle only public money. And by public money, I mean the revenue from, for cities, the revenue for counties, the revenue for water districts and other organizations like that. And what we'll do with that money, what the, an AB 57 bank will do with that money is work probably with community banks and credit unions to lend that money out as needed to, um, a, to small businesses, possibly homeowners, probably infrastructure projects, climate infrastructure projects, uh, responsibly with careful fiscal controls, but we would like to be able to see the kind of profits. North Dakota gets 17 or 18% return on investment, which is a huge return for any business and an even huger return for a bank. And those profits go back to the state. One thing North Dakota has done that many people are excited about is they refinance the student loans of everyone who goes to school in North Dakota and everyone who lives in North Dakota and goes to school anywhere at a much lower rate than the commercial slash federal rates. So that's the kind of thing we wanna see the public banks do. We believe they can do it. And we believe perhaps more firmly than that even we believe that the public banks can be transparent organizations where we can see where our money is going and we can help direct where our money is going and we can help influence how our money is spent. And as David said, that's the underpinning for it. I always hesitate to say that one thing is the underpinning for everything else, but it's an underpinning for all the democratization of finance. Uh, so a couple of other things about California. Uh, we spent some of last year trying to put together a bill for a state public bank that's currently on hold. Instead, the alliance that David and I are part of is partnering with the Service Employees International Union and the California Reinvestment Coalition on a bill to provide free banking services to everyone in California through the state. And um, we will put in the study stack some references on that for, for, for particularly Californians who are interested. There are public bank movements in many states around the country, many states and cities. New York is very active. Philadelphia is very active. New Mexico is very active. Arizona has a movement. We like to think of public banking as nonpartisan. It's sometimes it's a little difficult to convince the people on the other side of the, of the partisan divide that this is true, but it should be nonpartisan. There's really no reason why it shouldn't. And then finally, just to touch on the federal level, public banking came into the federal conversation in late 2019 when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and another legislature whose name is, another uh, assemblyman whose name is escaping me, Ed Markey, I think, announced the Green New Deal and said that they thought it could be funded by a network of public banks. Since then, uh, Rashida Tlaib has introduced a public banking act in the House and Sherrod Brown, who is the new chair of the Senate Banking and Finance Committee is talking about some very big public banking reforms, some of them akin to the ones I was just talking about, about providing bank accounts for people. 
but some of them also looking into public money and in particular federal guarantees for state and local public banks, which would make a vast difference to us in getting them established. And I think that's really enough to open it up. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, and I see that Mark is, is, uh, is with us now. Uh, welcome, Mark. I know that uh, you were uh, going to introduce us uh, 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 and sort of facilitate things, but understand that with your children and the, the fact that Debbie and I had asked for a different time, it sort of threw you off. So yes, it did. Yes, it did. I'm, I'm very calendar driven in what I do. And I have this on eight o'clock and I never changed that to seven o'clock. So it just Bo called me while I was in line getting food. He's like, hey, you're coming. I was like, oh, I've messed up something. <laughs> well, as my mama taught me to say, Mark, I hope that's the worst mistake you make today. What a <laughs> great day you'll have. That, that <laughs> is about the worst one I've made today. So I guess that's good. <laughs> All right. So so y'all, here's what we're going to do. So what you heard from me was a big opening framing. You heard Debbie do a little framing. So what I what we'd like to do is in the spirit of a coffee shop, we're a pretty crowded coffee shop conversation. But uh, what maybe what we'd like to do is this. Let's do a round of, say, uh, let's say four or five comments or questions. Right. Uh, Debbie and I will take notes on what what it is that y'all say. Uh, feel free, if you want to be one of those four or five, type your name uh, uh, into this uh, chat. The, the, into the, the chat. chat. And, and with the word, uh, and we'll know to call on you. If you're not able to do it, you can just say your name out loud. So what we'll do is a round of four or five comments or questions. Debbie and I will respond. We'll do another one. And he, I'm going to let y'all know right up front, Debbie and I have also asked to do that a couple of times. And then we've got some questions we wanna ask of y'all collectively, right? So that it really is a back and forth. So that's how I'd like to uh, suggest that we proceed. So if there's anybody with a comment or a question, let's take four or five of them uh, in a row. So I see Howard has raised his hand. Anybody else? Paul. Start with those two and, and let's get give people a chance to warm up and think about it. Okay, so we have three now. Howard, Paul, then Bo Young. Howard. And John, now John. All right. All right, well, first of all, congratulations, Debbie, on uh, the uh, successes in California and all of that, advancing public banking. Um, we uh, uh, feel like that, uh, I can't say I'm speaking for everyone, but I would say that uh, public banking is um, going to play an important part in uh, educating people about our money system. Because um, I think we will soon find, and, and I think that uh, because public banking has met so little opposition, you know, you would think if it was a threat, there would be a lot of opposition, but, um, because there isn't, I think that a lot of the cities and municipalities are already trying to figure out how to do their um, public money. But I think the, the banking thing would be a really good thing to get more of it into, uh, hold on a little bit more of it. But as Herman Daly says, you know, let's nationalize the money, not the banks, because that's where the power is. And that's, uh, I have a little, equation I say money equals power equals government a lot of people turn it around they say you know the government equals the money and that equals power but uh, I think we'll find that the money is the power it's the power to dominate every industry and every uh, world government and it's the power to uh, govern us and we should have that power be public and so I think uh, my comment basically is just that public banking, I think, is an important step. Do you agree? <laughs> Paul? Okay. I wish I could be as articulate as Howard. Um, I have so many questions, but I was very uh, excited to hear that you, uh, David, want this to be a kind of a two-way conversation. 
I, I think public banking is great. Uh, it's, it's about time. Um, I've had several conversations with Ellen Brown and she is a very much on board with monetary reform and feels that is kind of fundamental to everything. However, I have to admit someone here. Um, it seems to be absent from the public banking dialogue. Um, and I'm hoping that we can rectify that because obviously you guys are resonating you know, with the country and with, uh, uh, I, it's a little suspicious that there hasn't been pushback yet from the banks. I think it's gonna come. So don't get overconfident um, because you're taking away their business. Um, but I, I think um, in some sense, um, I'm gonna put this in a, in a funny way, is that public banking has to have built in failure. That is, it has to be able to fund projects that won't necessarily return a, pro a profit. And right now, I don't think that's possible um, because of uh, the, the, the money to back up these um, failures is not there yet. And you'll, it'll only be there uh, with monetary reform. So I would be interested in getting your take on, uh, and maybe this will come later in the conversation, on how we can work together to inject each other's messages in, into our narratives. So that's just something to think about. So uh, I know Bo uh, Young and John are already on the stack, but Debbie, because, like, it feels like there's so much there already. I'm gonna stop on those two, ask you to comment uh, on what you heard, and then I will as well. Okay, uh, quickly, the big banks are opposed to public banking. So far, it has been what I would call kind of low energy opposition. They come to the hearings, they tell everyone that nobody can do any banking but them. They ignore the fact that they're incredibly bad at it. But what they haven't done is brought out the big guns. They haven't brought out expensive lobbyists. They haven't thrown vast amounts of money into the into the fight. And we believe that they will. I think it was Paul who said he expects it. We expect it. Um, uh, monet as far as monetary reform, you're absolutely right that it is not in the public banking dialogue. And that's a concern of mine too. There's a feeling, I think, among some people in the movement that monetary reform, I'm, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this, that allying with monetary reform just adds another level of things you have to convince people of. I'm, not con I, I'm hoping to learn more from you about injecting each other's messages because I am to the extent that I understand it, I'm on board with monetary reform and I know that Ellen Brown is. Um, and as far as built-in failure, yes, absolutely. And yes, monetary reform will make that much easier, but all banks have a level of built-in failure. And we that has to be figured into any bank's loan profile. It has to be figured into any bank's risk management. It's just the bigger, bigger projects will need monetary reform for the built-in failures to be as big as they need to be. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, like Debbie, I wanna uh, uh, underscore, we actually have had opposition to public banking. Uh, it, it hasn't been as fierce as I expected, but it's going to be because uh, we, we passed 857 and we're already beginning to encounter uh, the pushback from the big banks. Uh, we do have the advantage though that I don't think that uh, the Alliance for Just Money has, and that is that it's easier for us to talk about, oh, a public bank is just a bank that's operated for the public interest, as opposed to a bank that is operated to benefit individual private shareholders. So we actually have an easier conversation to start. Like Debbie, I want to encourage Paul and everyone else First, I acknowledge that the, the, the conversation around uh, like monetary policy has not been part of the public banking movement. 
And that's because the public banking movement is a citizen led movement and y'all have not been part of it. And I don't say that as uh, an accusation. I say it as just candor, right? Like if you want to see the, the theories of monetary, uh, 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 monetary conversation happen in public banking spaces, you have to get in public banking spaces. Uh, one of the things that we've done very successfully in the California Public Banking Alliance and the newly forming National Public Banking Alliance is that we're literally taking people where they are and educating them. And I will use this as a bit of a, uh, a, a tease out. And that is, if, you're, if you would like to get involved in public banking, there are really two national organizations to think about. One is the Public Banking Institute, and the other is the National Public Banking Alliance. And in a nutshell, it goes like this. And it's pretty broad, but in a nutshell, it goes like this. If you are interested in bringing conservatives and progressives together on public banking as a policy, probably the Public Banking Institute is the place because they're really trying to come from a place of this is good public policy and conservatives should support it. The, the difference with the National Public Banking Alliance is that we come very specifically out of climate justice work, out of racial justice work, and we are full throttled embracing uh, that notion. So not that those are competing, but those are sort of different, uh, uh, different approaches, right? Uh, and so I'll just uh, ask to make sure that Hobart, you include both of those in the study stack. Uh, I'm really excited to say that we have now two more people. So let's hear from Bo Young and then John, then Debbie and I will react. Then we'll hear from Ed and Earl. So Bo Young, you're up. Okay, before I get to my question, I just want to make a technical announcement. For people who uh, may or may not be familiar with Zoom, if you look in the top right-hand corner, there's an icon called View. If you click speaker, the person who is speaking will be big on your screen. If you, if you choose gallery, you'll see everybody in small thumbnail little boxes. So you can decide how you wanna view uh, what's happening just to let you know. Um, in terms of what I wanted to stay on the stack, uh, really, really uh, thrilled to have both of you on here, uh, David and Debbie. Um, as I mentioned in the invite, uh, we are very much natural allies. And my question has to do with Debbie's comment when you were talking, you had no lobbyists and no budget. It was all grassroots power. Um, I'd love to hear more about your organizing efforts, how, uh, how you educated the public, how you use social, social media. Um, all of those things would be great. Um, thank you. John. Well, uh, uh, we're here in a little town, in Athens, Ohio, and I'm pleased to say that our county treasurer told me a couple of years ago that they transferred the county accounts from Chase Bank to Hocking Valley Bank, which is a locally owned bank. It's a commercial bank, not a public bank, but it is a local bank that cares a lot about the community. So small banking is really important to, to serve communities. And uh, so, uh, uh, and I, what I, I, I really uh, uh, want to say that uh, in a sense, Ellen Brown got me into this. The first book I read was The Web of Debt. Uh, and uh, I, I recently heard her talk in another uh, situation and, and, and uh, uh, she gave an introduction to what's wrong with a monetary system that's the same as any one of us would give in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, the Alliance for Just Money. Um, and uh, of course, part of the, the problem is enormous amounts of debt. Uh, and different people have different ways of looking at debt. MMT says, don't worry about it, but there are a lot of people who do worry about the debt uh, and the consequences of interest being paid on, on debt. And so one of the things that the Alliance, of course, is interested in is a, a kind of a reform that will, uh, that will have a major impact on debt in the sense that money creation itself will no longer be created as loans, as debt. Uh, and the Public Banking Institute, as you, as you put, uh, said, David, um, it's a, it's a non-reformist reform. 
it's within the, the system of, 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 of bank creation of money, of what Joseph Huber calls bank money, as opposed to as opposed to sovereign money, which would be created by the by, by the government. And uh, the the uh, um, the way my understanding that the banking regulations apply to all depository institutions. So essentially, public banks are going to be governed by the same uh, the, the same uh, systems as uh, as govern commercial banks in terms of banking regulations. Uh, and so uh, that would uh, put th them very much in the fractional reserve system, uh, just like all the other banks. And the difference, as you point out, which is a, a very healthy one, is that because it's public ownership, it can shape where those loans go. But essentially what banks do is make loans. Uh, what sovereign money does, of course, is op offer the opportunity for government to create money, not as debt, and to make it available for infrastructure and all the other good things that you uh, and we both want to see done uh, by, by the government. So I think we do have a lot in common here in terms of where we're going. And I think a, a commonality of these, 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 these approaches is, is a healthy one. So thanks for your talk here. Great. Debbie, would you, uh, do you want to go or would you prefer me to start on this one? Why don't you start, David? So, uh, so there's two different things and, and I'll start with Bo's first. Uh, Bo, I appreciate you asking about, hey, like how did y'all do that, right? Because, and I think that that is, um, it'll lead me into my reaction uh, to John and, and I see it's bubbling up in the chat too. So part of what we did successfully in the public banking movement was literally we took people where they were and gave them a very concrete thing that they could be part of uh, and then explained it in, in common sense uh, language that, that they were able to repeat, right? So, so uh, what that meant was, you know, look, the reality is that the, the, the public banking movement really did get birth out of Standing Rock or the modern, like our effort got birthed out of Standing Rock. Uh, Ellen Brown had written that book a long time ago, right? Like, so it stayed in pretty, frankly, white hyper-educated circles, the whole notion, but it was at Standing Rock that the movement got born. And by that, I mean, and to be very blunt, so there was a, a real push to divest, like stop funding these fossil fuel infrastructure projects, move and let's move our money out of Wall Street and, and, and punish uh, the, the, the big banks and Wall Street that were investing in these projects. And very quickly, we saw uh, cities of San Francisco and Seattle uh, and Chicago were, were saying, okay, we hear you. We want to get out of Wall Street money uh, or get out of big banks. And literally, I can tell you in Seattle, the, the, the city looked at it and said they could not find, because they were so big, John, they could not find any local commercial bank, no credit union, no financial institution would take the Seattle government's uh, uh, deposits because it was too big. Literally, the, 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 both credit unions and small commercial banks said, we can't handle that much money. And for, for myself and a lot of others, I was like, what I didn't understand. So it was the course of understanding what the problem was that helped me and I think Trinity and Debbie and a couple of others begin to realize, oh, okay, the problem is how the banking uh, industry operates. The problem is uh, what the business model there is. So, uh, and I'm gonna uh, actually get Debbie to talk to this too, and then circle back to John's point, because those are both profound comments and questions you've made. Though the reality is that we were successful because we took a problem and uh, that everybody understood and made it in and, and designed a solution that people could understand. It doesn't solve all of the problems. Absolutely. And we'll get into that through the course of this conversation. It's already starting to bubble up. I do not say that public banking is the, the, the transformational. It's a non-reformist reform. It's a very important one. But I don't for a minute think that it actually solves the problems uh, that I want to solve. 
uh, but it, it is an important solution. And then we were able then to put a local ballot initiative in the city of Los Angeles. We actually lost that one, right? But it was able to jumpstart. We were able to, to frame the question in such a way that we began to, to, to develop some framing met, uh, language and frame some solutions around it. And then, and this is the last thing that I'll say before I turn to Debbie, then we found champions in the California state. Like, like I'm a Green Party member, many of you know that, right? But we found progressive Democrats who were willing to champion this and we worked with them to craft proposed legislation that could actually move. And that's where, and I gotta be, I'll be very honest, I would have lost any amount of money in a bet. Debbie, you probably remember this. When I first came on, I said, we will not win this in one legislative session. There's just no way. But we have to frame it properly so that in the next session or the third or the fourth session, we'll be able to build a momentum. Never, my friends, have I been happier to be proven wrong. We actually did win it in one legislative session. It's, it's, it's like somebody, we need to write this up, Debbie, because like what we did is a stunning victory. But the way we did it was you using very simple to understand uh, uh, concepts. And as Kali Akuno, my, my dear friend and comrade says, break it down without dumbing it down. And I say, with respect, the Alliance for Just Money, y'all got some work to do on that. Because every time I talk to y'all, I end up feeling, maybe I've advanced, like I often get confused by hearing y'all talk to one another. And that's going to be a problem. Debbie, do you want to uh, talk about the success of AB 857? I do. I, th I think this is very funny that um, what, what's turning out to happen, I may have to turn off my camera if you can't hear me. Um, but what's turning out to happen is that David is doing big framing and I'm doing something more resembling details. And if you want to talk about the details of how we passed AB 857, the first thing that has to be said is David mentioned her name in passing. We have a powerhouse sort of lead organizer in our, um, in our leaderless organization. We have a powerhouse organizer named Trinity Tran, who just this weekend was named the California Progressive Champion for 2020 by the California Progressive Alliance. And Trinity, um, I think many, many people worked very, very hard, but Trinity was, was one of the driving forces behind what happened. And it was, I mean, David is 100% correct that it was taking a clear problem, presenting a clear solution. But I think you also have to say that we did a great deal of work bringing on grassroots organizations, unions, environmental organizations, economic justice organizations, racial organizations. We had hundreds of organizational supporters. We had thousands of individual supporters. We worked very hard to get as many co-authors and legislative co-sponsors for the bill as possible. Um, this was 2019 when you could still go places. We wore out a lot of shoe leather in Sacramento, going to legislative offices. Um, we responded to the kind of lackluster, but, but significant attacks from the big banks. And we never let up. It was, for me, it was my first real serious legislative work. And it was, I think, anomalous for it to be a success. But I certainly saw how the sausage is made. And I'm, and I'm glad I did. Um, to respond to the other question, yes, banks are banks. Public banks will have somewhat different regulations than other banks, but we will be in the fractional reserve system. We will be operating on debt. It would be phenomenal to be operating on assets. I have just finally wrapped my brain around the fact that when money goes into the bank, it becomes a liability. When, it, when, it, when a bank receives deposits, those deposits are liabilities until they're lent out when they're assets again. This is crazy, but it's also true. And um, I, I think that's what I have to say for now. 
So, uh, De and Debbie really, uh, thank you, Debbie. And uh, she began to address John's point and I'll just add on to it. I'm, and I'm glad, I agree with Debbie. Like, and John, your point is absolutely correct. Public banking is still going to be subject to all the other regulations. It is still a debt-based uh, uh, way of creating money. There's no doubt about it. Is, and that's why I say it's not the end-all be-all solution, but it is an incredible uh, move forward to, to begin to democratize the idea of finance, the idea that banking would be, do, would be uh, controlled by and, and to benefit the public as a pro, opposed to just the private shareholders who actually own the bank. Uh, that to me is a huge step forward. And I do think that I'd, I don't want to let the perfect become the enemy of the good. I absolutely personally believe, just as you say, John, it's better to have the city of Athens banking with a local small commercial bank than it is a Wall Street bank. I would, I would say it goes like this. So the worst kind, uh, like, uh, uh, so yes, from a Wall Street bank to a small commercial bank, that's a step in the right direction. Yet another step in the right direction would be a credit union. Even a better step would be a local public bank, right? So there, there is a spectrum uh, about how to think about what these different re uh, reforms might be to actually get to democratizing finance. We at public banking don't think it's the answer, but we are, at least I think it is a, an important answer. So now we're gonna go to Ed, then Earl. Ed, you're up. Hi, I'm an American, I moved back to Canada. And since I've been back, I've been looking at the macroeconomics of the Canadian system and so on, and find that in 1974, the, the country stopped uh, creating its own money. And it's now has been done by the public banks, private banks ever since then. And uh, it's occurred to me that all money should be created by government, by the central banks or whatever. And all money in the private banks should be borrowed from the central bank and it should they, the private bank should pay interest on it. All money, the use of money is worth something. And in this regime of the uh, uh, neoliberal economies we've had for the last 50 years is the, that the interest rate has, they've tried to use that to control the money supply where the money supply should be separated from interest because interest is a value that should be uh, a minimum amount of interest on everything. And uh, so I was wondering whether there should be any movement within the private uh, public banks to also create money locally. Just that question, thank you. Debbie? Um, I thought we were gonna do a couple at a time, but I, I will say about that one, that's where we need you. Yeah, right. I, I, the short that, answer. The, it's outside my area of expertise. I believe it's outside David's. It is, it is why this group, is why the Alliance for Just Money is a terrific ally to the public banking movement. We need to learn from it. So Mike writes in, how does Glass-Steagall fix into pu the public banking framework? So I'll just answer. I got nothing, David. Uh, you know, look. So remember that Glass-Steagall, basically what it did, uh, it separated commercial banking from investment banking. That's whenever the FDIC was actually created. That's, that's in a nutshell how I understand it. So the, the reality is that uh, Glass-Steagall uh, would be uh, uh, another, or, and there's a reason, by the way, I appreciate, Earl, your sort of reference of the neoliberals, right? And let's say... Democrats and Republicans alike are, are in agreement about the neoliberal uh, approach uh, to the economy, political economy, and to our government. So like the way that Glass-Steagall fits into the public banking framework is, again, public banking is not what y'all are trying to do at the Alliance for Just Money. We are, we're not actually addressing uh, that, that difference. We're acknowledging that. What Debbie and I are saying is, that public banking is a step in the right direction that we think that y'all should be supporting. And so far I haven't heard 
uh, you know, any opposition to that, but I've also never seen the Alliance for Just Money take an actual position on public banking. The second thing that I and Debbie are actually saying is, uh, you know, y'all should actually get involved in public banking efforts and start to uh, address some of those questions or bring some of those questions into it. Um, next up, we have Lucille. No, I, I wasn't there as a question, I don't believe. I, oh, okay. um, but I had a comment just that we, uh, to let you know, we do, the Alliance for Just Money does have a book club going on right now on, um, that's sponsored by the Alliance and that is studying uh, Brown's web of debt. So um, we're, we're, we're learning and looking closely at it. And many of us know her from her involvement in the American Monetary Institute before she uh, started the Public Banking Institute. So um, we're working with the content. I think we also have on our website a recent posting that, that looks, that situates um, friends and neighbors of the Alliance. <laughs> And I, Hover could speak to this more, but I believe that uh, public banking is is on there, and you know it's it's framed around um, the uh, money question. And so, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I am on the board of the Alliance for Just Money, and um, you know, we are driven by our mission, and so that is what we existed or we exist, we founded ourselves to, to work on. And so as an, as an organization, that's what we work on. We have not come out you know, opposed to public banking, um, nor as you said, have we endorsed it, um, but you know, to go beyond opposing it or endorsing it, but you know, we, I don't think we would oppose it, but the lens through which we would oppose it if we ever did would be if, it um, got in the way if it made it harder to achieve just money. And that's a big if, as far as I've looked into it and understand this point, it doesn't make it harder. But it's an important question. If, if it would make it harder, then for us to endorse it would be in defiance of our mission. <laughs> that we created ourselves to work on. And believe me, it's hard enough to work on it. So um, beyond endorsing it to actually get involved and advocate it, work on it, um, would take us away from our mission. Um, so that's all, but I didn't actually raise my hand to talk or raise a question, <laughs> but I am studying it because I wanted to understand how, how Ellen Brown got from as John laid out the critique of the existing system, which is very compatible to, to what we understand, to the an answer or maybe the answer being public banking. And you know, I, I haven't talked with her directly, but I know some of us have, and it's been said here she advocates it. So um, yeah, and it. Um, I would like to, yeah, anyhow, I'll be quiet. <laughs> I didn't have a question. So let's go to Joe Polito. Hi, uh, thanks very much for this presentation. Uh, it's very interesting. And uh, I definitely feel it's another arrow in the quiver to make things better. You mentioned at the beginning um, that it would promote uh, uh, benefits to the underclass, to uh, racial justice and uh, the marginalized and so forth. Um, I can see why a, f you know, a, a, a banking system that is trying to do its job and uh, that is uh, invest in things um, would disproportionately benefit those communities. Um, but I wondered what kind of investments, what kind of loans, uh, specifically, you know, what, what are you seeing in terms of what they would do as opposed to the uh, commercial banking system that would uh, benefit us all in general and again, disproportionately those you mentioned. David, I can take that if you want. Go ahead. 
so one of the concepts that we're, that's a great question, first of all, because if you can't get into the practicalities, if you're just sitting around going public banks are great because they're great, you're not doing anybody any good. Um, one of the things, the concepts that we're working with that I find very helpful is a concept called negative and positive screens. Uh, so all banks have loan departments and loan policies and loan officers. And the way we envision public banks, particularly ABA 57 California public banks, they would have both negative and positive loan screens. A negative loan screen would be, are you investing in fossil fuel extraction? Are you building developments in uh, underserved neighborhoods that don't benefit the residents of those neighborhoods? Are you taking waterfront access away from people who need it? That's a negative screen that would make you much more unlikely to get a loan from a public bank. A positive screen would be, are you a minority owned small business? Are you a regenerative project, right? So those screens can be built into the DNA of the bank. And then the second prong of that, which is very particularly near and dear to my heart, is directing the bank governance, directing what kinds of people in what uh, proportions sit on the bank board. How many, we are committed in the East Bay to a bank board where more than a majority of the board of directors are people with direct vettable, responsible community involvement and commitments to the needs of the community. So that the directors and the policies work hand in hand. And then the annual community oversight is the third prong. So thank you. So I skipped Earl accidentally. So we're gonna go Earl, then Susan, then Paul. Earl? Hello, David. Um, good to interact with you again. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, I agree with everything you and uh, Debbie said, uh, including about the efforts of Ellen Brown and Trinity Tran. Uh, they did a marvelous job moving this forward. I just have a few comments. Um, in getting public banks, I think if possible, the requirement that is standard to provide uh, roughly 100% collateral for public deposits should not apply to a public bank that only has its own deposits. Um, the reason for that regulation is that private banks, when they take public deposits, they're handling other people's money, mainly the the public's money, taxpayers' money, and they have an incentive to maximize profit for themselves, which is in very much conflict with the public interest in many cases. That's not true of a public bank handling its own government's money. And providing 100% collateral greatly increases the cost of running a bank. And um, Dan Metzger, who did a... Uh, uh, part of a feasibility study for Santa Fe that was very well done, uh, concluded that that would make uh, the bank a no-go financially, at least for a small public bank. So that's one thing that uh, should uh, be looked at very closely. Another requirement is um, that I think is not necessary for a public bank is to join the FDIC. Um, that's pretty standard for private banks. That makes sense because they take deposits from many different small depositors. But the insurance limit on that is $250,000. And a public bank that only has its own money in, on deposit is going to have $100 million or more, meaning that that insurance covers far less than 1% of its deposits. So it's rather meaningless that way. Adds costs, adds regulations that don't really help uh, stabilize a public bank. 
The Bank of North Dakota has never been a member of the FDIC, and they've been much stronger than the private banks. Uh, and the new, newly formed uh, Bank of American Samoa uh, is not uh, a member of the F FDIC, even though it joined the Federal Reserve, it was not required to do so. And again, it would have been of no benefit. So those are th two things I think people should look at. Another one is, uh, in order to start a bank, it usually takes several years to become profitable. And that often upsets uh, public uh, officials who uh, don't want to lose money in a new enterprise. And a way to, to avoid that is to have a public bank uh, refinance existing long-term debt of the institution. Um, that way you have an immediate source of income coming from say bonds or certificates of participation or another form of long-term debt that states often have. Um, and you have immediate income to the bank as well as saving interest to the uh, community, the uh, city, county, or state. And by being profitable immediately, you do away with a lot of those fears of uh, uh, legislators who are concerned about uh, funding a bank that they may have to bail out when they don't have enough money for so many things already. We face that here in Colorado. I'm um, part of the Colorado public banking movement. Uh, I'm also an attorney, so I've gotten into a lot of the legal issues. But that's another concern. And in regard to the question about Glass-Steagall, I think my answer to the question on that is repealing Glass-Steagall greatly increased the risk to the banking system. It allowed banks that are supposed to be conservative in making loans to make all kinds of outrageous uh, investments in risky enterprises that ultimately brought down our economy. That was a great contributor. So if you want to have, uh, I mean, public banks, uh, I'm sure, uh, would be prohibited from, if they're properly designed, that's our plan, to, would be prohibited from um, investing, acting as an investment bank. And so um, I think in that regard, the answer is uh, public banks should avoid that kind of uh, risk. Uh, that's all I have to say. Um, Debbie, would you like to react? I would, I would. Earl, you're clearly extremely knowledgeable. And if we could have had you trying to convince the California legislature, legislature when we were negotiating AB 857, you would have been an enormous asset. Collateralization is something that worries all jurisdictions, but in California, it is an extreme hot button. I can't tell you how many times in 2019, we heard legislators refer to the Orange County bankruptcy. The Orange County bankruptcy was in the 1980s. It was a clear case of fraud by a county treasurer, not fraud, mismanagement by a county treasurer, but it scared California legislators in a way that clearly is still true 40 years later. And the co California collateralization requirement is just not going to disappear. Um, I'm aware of the Santa Fe study. We think there are ways to handle the collateralization requirements that won't make a bank unfeasible. The exact same thing is true of FDIC. We don't want it. We don't think we need it. We know it's another hurdle. We know it's another obstacle, but we were basically forced to put it in to get the bill passed. Uh, we hope to work with the FDIC to make this, that part as painless as possible. Um, but we know they're going to be, I hope they're not gonna be, a, or, <coughs> excuse me, a roadblock. They're gonna be a significant issue. <coughs> On your third point, <clears throat> that's not something that we've thought about, that at least I've thought about. I'm sure there are people in the movement who have about refinancing debt as a way to quick profitability. Our favorite way to quick profitability or, or at least quick safety is federal loan guarantees. 
which was impossible from 2016 to 2020 and is at least potentially possible now. But I did make a note and it is something that we will have our uh, policy walks look into. Okay. So we have a, a large uh, stack, so I'm gonna move us along. It, it goes Susan, Paul, Ben, Carly, Ken, then Timothy. Howard, I put you at the end because you've already had an opportunity to uh, ask one question, but I would encourage folks to continue the lively discussion on, uh, on the chat that I'm seeing. But in terms of the microphone, that's the order. Susan, you're up. Susan, if you're speaking, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I'll start again. Uh, David, you talked about um, the big push that the public bank movement got from Standing Rock and the divestment movement as, as a result of Standing Rock. And I just, um, out of loyalty, want to point out that uh, both Debbie and I come out of the Occupy movement, um, which goes back even further than Standing Rock and really is part of the part of many strands that led to the public banking movement. That's one point. Next, I would, um, I understand people's ambivalence, especially people who believe in uh, sovereign, uh, sovereign countries being able to uh, print their own money. I understand their objections to um, a debt-based monetary system, but the solution to that is Jubilees. And the person that talks about that the most, um, most eloquently is Michael Hudson. And I would urge everybody to read his books about uh, Babylonia and where the Jubilee, the notion of Jubilee came from. He says it's absolutely critical that all debts be forgiven uh, at a regular period, um, regularly over and over again for a civilization to survive. And he thinks one of the reasons ours is collapsing is because of the huge increasing debt. Um, thought I had a third point, but I will let it go. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for sharing that. So let's go again. It's Paul, Ben, Carly, Ken, Timothy. Paul, you're up. Okay, I already had a chance to speak, so I'm gonna be really brief. I just wanna thank you very much for the feedback that you gave us in terms of our message doesn't easily get through to people and we, we struggle with this. So I'm looking forward to uh, continuing this discussion further to see how we can partner in some way um, to increase uh, people's understanding because it, it people it's monetary reform is so simple that it's that was that is an obstacle <laughs> uh, people are always looking for complexity so let me just move on to the let, move on to the next person and if there's time at the end you can get back to me ben hello, hello. okay i'm here now um i wanted to ask so earlier today i was doing some reading up on um the public banking app that like um act that Talib introduced um, to uh, Congress at the federal level. And I read the legislation, it like allowed different um, governments at different levels, well, not different governments at different levels, but different entities to get pursue public bank charters and have like a legal structure around that. And the, I believe the three types of entities that were listed were like state or tribal governments themselves, um, corporations that are chartered by corporations or nonprofits um, chartered by state or tribal governments. And that would be it for like what, like what that were specifically chartered with a um, uh, purpose that's in the public interest. So I guess the question that I have is how decentralized you envisioned public banking ought to be. You know, like could like large cities, could you have like the public bank of Seattle or they would it just be at the state level? Like I, I wanna understand what the California bill specifically did legally in California. Like at what level are these public banks um, existing? Do you see it as more advantageous for them to be more de decentralized, less decentralized and why? That's the question. 
A great question, uh, Ben. I'll, I'll take this one uh, because the California Public Banking Alliance has an absolute commitment uh, to local and regional public banks. Like that is literally where we are uh, uh, leaning in. Uh, and we believe that that it so so that's that your 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 question is a good one and we actually have uh, unanimity because that's literally why we were created yeah. right in order to advance it so uh, the the federal legislation that you referenced uh, uh, Debbie did talk about it in part of her overall framing just like we can talk about some of the state public banking efforts but but to answer your question clearly and unambiguously. At the California Public Banking Alliance, we believe in local public banks. David, let me let me just add something to that. I I I want the best of both worlds. I want local public banks working in the in the public interest. And yes, certain San Francisco can have its own public bank. Seattle can have its own public bank. A city like Chicago can certainly have its own public bank. We want, especially in California, for those banks to be networked to share back-end expenses, back-end software, um, compliance regs, all the things that make banking expensive. Um, we wanna be able to share that and uh, group source it as much as possible. And we also want um, smaller municipalities, like da David is in Humboldt. Humboldt might be big enough to have its own public bank, we are but, not. <laughs> that's what I thought. But what we would like is for to create a public bank in the East Bay, in the Oakland and Berkeley and that that county, for those of you who don't know our region, and then to have Humboldt be welcome as a depositor in that bank, right? So that we envision the bigger regions and cities being able to handle the money of the smaller regions and cities and also the water districts and transit districts. Thanks for that. And I did just go ahead and drop the mission statement into the Cal of the California Public Banking Alliance. Uh, again, like uh, Debbie did say that like, she wants the best of both worlds and uh, totally understandable. And uh, to underscore Ben, the CPBA specifically was created for the creation of local and regional public banks. Yes. Uh, let's go to Carly, then it looks like Ken passed, so it'll be Carly, then Timothy. Hi, thank you so much for um, everything you all have shared so far. This has been exciting. Um, so I am kind of piggybacking my question off of a comment that Harrison added in the chat, um, which would, be like, what What have your social media strategies been? Um, that's something that, you know, I'm really motivated by in this group and, and trying to get a, a stronger social media presence. But I'm just wondering um, if you all have used that to your advantage and if so, what that's looked like. David, you want me to take that? I think I'm closer to that than yes. you are. Um, the California Public Banking Alliance has a huge built-in advantage in social media, which is that we're organized by regions. So not only does the Alliance have a social media presence on Facebook and Twitter, but each region also has its own social media presence and we boost signal for each other, we amplify each other. I put a, um, an announcement of this talk on the Public Bank East Bay Twitter today, and I tagged all the public bank organizations that I know of. And so it got retweeted. I'm not a Facebook <clears throat> person, uh, but it got retweeted in a way that gave it a lot more news. We also, we make, uh, the Alliance has a MailChimp audience of about 6,000 people. We email, we email them regularly, but not incessantly with news and updates and particularly with asks. I think one of the things that helps a lot in a social media strategy is if you want people to do something particular. I think there's a difference between, and I, I imagine that the Alliance doesn't have a lot of asks as much as it has information. And I hear that you're struggling with information presentation, but we can say, 
please find organizations to endorse this, to sign this letter. Please come to this press conference. I'm the, the ABA 1177 asks just went out today. And if I get a minute, I'll post them in the chat. So partly so you can do them, but also you so you can see what they look like. Um, does, does that answer your question or did you want more than that? No, I think that that's great. I definitely got some Carly, yeah, took some notes on that. Yeah. The, the other thing that I, so yes to everything that Debbie said. Another thing that I have seen that we do well, both at the California Public Banking Alliance and every other social change effort that actually uses social media effectively, and that is to engage your people uh, like one-on-one. -on -one. In other words, like too often, uh, it, it is always a one-way street and you're not actually like the only, the, like the only way that social media actually works is if you use it as the initial spot to begin a conversation and then you actually transfer them from engaging them on social media to then turning them into actual advocates uh, of your organization or your movement. So I, I think Carly, everything that Debbie said, yes, and engaging social media. So, and, and honestly, you, like, you can't really argue with people on social media if you're gonna use it effectively. Like, like uh, it, it, it ends up actually hindering communication rather than adding to it. Let's go to Timothy and then we'll go uh, to John uh, who had a question on chat that we'll answer. So Timothy, you're up. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you? Okay, good. Uh, I'm Tim Havel. I live in Boston, and I've been working for almost a decade now on founding a public bank here in Massachusetts. I think in the current legislative, legislative session, we've got a great bill, and we have a better chance at it than ever before. So I just wanted to put in a plug for that to start with. I also like to say that, David, uh, I remember you when you came out and spoke at a Unitarian church here in Boston about 10 years ago, and you were part of my inspiration then. I was extremely impressed oh. then by how articulate you are and how, how, what a forceful advocate you are for whatever it is. You were talking about constitutional amendments for reigning in corporate power, another uh, area I'm involved in at that time. Uh, so I'm a little intimidated to uh, speak in an audience with you present, but I, I'll do my best. Uh, the thing I wanted to say most was that in my view, the sovereign money initiative uh, or movement and the uh, public banking movement are not merely are not separate at all. In fact, they badly need one another. And uh, the reason is is that the the sovereign money movement. I, I'm first going to say what the weakness of the public of the sovereign money movement is, and then I'm going to talk about the weakness of the public money or public banking movement and why they need each other. The sovereign money movement is essentially. Uh, I'm going to probably uh, raise some hackles here. Uh, but I'm going to try to state things very bluntly, uh, is try to take the power for money creation that is currently given to the Federal Reserve, which is, however, statutorily constrained to use it only to prop up or provide liquidity to the private banking sector uh, directly, uh, and instead puts it into the Department of the Treasury where it becomes uh, subject to public oversight and can be used uh, for the public good directly. That's very roughly speaking my understanding of it. Uh, the situation is, however, that that puts the power to create arbitrary amounts of money by fiat uh, in one place. That power potentially exceeds the power of the presidency itself. Uh, you put all that power in one place, and even if you've got elaborate governance systems in place and have really thought about things as hard as you can, I guarantee you that sooner or later some enterprising politician like, for example, Donald Trump will come along and will find a way to subvert it for their own nefarious ends. Uh, it's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, the current banking system for all its many faults, and I won't go into them here, uh, does have the advantage that it distributes the power for money creation among many different players with different interests uh, who do not necessarily like one another. Uh, this distributes the power and tends to inhibit the ability of any single player uh, to grab uh, all the power for themselves, although Goldman Sachs has done pretty well, not to mention BlackRock and so on, but we won't go there now. Uh, the public banking movement, uh, however, uh, needs liquidity. Uh, it needs a backup, as pointed out here. It needs uh, a backstop for when it makes bad loans. 
And right now, uh, the public banking movement, if public banks are formed, they do get access to the Fed's discount window, which allows them to borrow at 0.25% and then to lend out at, at only a slightly higher rate. Uh, it's a huge help, uh, but it's not everything. And uh, that is actually one of the main reasons for forming a public bank is just to get give state and local and municipal governments access to the Fed's money creation powers, which it does. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it would benefit hugely from having uh, something like uh, a more centralized uh, and more publicly accountable uh, central bank uh, or central source of, of a fountainhead for money. Uh, so. The situation as I see it is that uh, public banks have, I mean, even the Fed has 12 regional branches that were created in order to make it more responsive to local economies around the country, uh, given that it did have this mixed purpose that uh, some of it was supposed to be publicly accountable. It had a board of governors, at least, that was appointed by the president, confirmed by Congress. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, so I'm losing the, my, focus here, but the, the situation as I see it is that the public banking movement would benefit enormously from having uh, a sovereign money fountainhead uh, that uh, was supportive of it. Uh, and this would make it so much more strong. And on the other hand, uh, by delegating uh, some of its abilities to uh, say what happens to the money that it creates to the public banking network that we hope to see develop, uh, you would be distributing that power, you would be making it more responsive to the local needs in ways that I think it would be very difficult to, for a single centralized authority to do. And uh, you'd be uh, building a system uh, that is in some ways uh, analogous to some of the intentions of some of the people who are involved in creating the Federal Reserve System, but you'd be making it publicly accountable from uh, top to bottom. So. I would just like to say that I think the movements are extremely complementary, and I would encourage people to think more about how they do complement each other, perhaps along the lines of what I've talked about, which is by no means the final word. Thank you. We're going to turn it over to Gover, uh, Hobart, but I first want to give Debbie an opportunity to react to what you heard from Timothy. I just, I loved what I heard from Timothy. I agree with, the one thing I would say is that borrowing from the federal discount window is extremely short term. It's like literally overnight in most cases. No, but it's, I gone, that... it's gone to three months now uh, and it can be rolled over indefinitely. That's one of the okay. things that the Fed has done recently. But in, in any event, I thought, I thought you know, many people here have, and Earl and Timothy struck me in particular, are clearly extremely knowledgeable about the things we think about. And I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, Hobart, I know that you were going to uh, do some housekeeping, I think. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in here just uh, to get uh, uh, a little balance then, because if this is a two-way conversation, I'd like to uh, call on John Howell to talk about a little bit about our understanding of banking and why we think uh, that it should be reformed as it should be. But before that, John, hold on. Um, I just want to say that, that, that public banking is really, let's say in this spring, uh, very much on the radar of the Alliance for Just Money. Uh, it's not only this coffee house tonight, uh, but the 26th of April on our regular time, it will be a Monday, we will have Professor Mark Castle uh, doing a presentation and he is an expert of the you know, highly functional decentralized public banking system in Germany. And he thinks, and I think too, uh, and, and another expert, uh, Professor Richard Werner, thinks that too, is that we can learn a lot about and of that uh, German system. At the same time, we also have Ben uh, Ringinger, who posed a question. He's actually our intern, and he is writing wonderful summaries of different uh, uh, acts, uh, legislation, pieces of legislation that are of interest to us. And he's actually working now on, on a summary and an analysis or a presentation of the pros and cons of the uh, Public Banking Act uh, from Rashid. So it is on our uh, 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 radar. Um, you know, a lot of things, as you said, we will put in the study stack uh, for people to, to explore. 
And with that, I'll give it over to Donna Howell uh, to maybe also correct some mis misunderstandings that there might be about what we're up to. And then, you know, let's have another round of questions and answers. John. Yeah, th thanks, Robert, and uh, thank uh, everyone in this discussion. I think there have been a lot of good points made. And I would just like to point out that uh, uh, the Alliance for Just Money uh, came out of uh, the Alliance, um, uh, the, the uh, AMI, um, uh, American Monetary Institute, uh, which was a think tank, as many of you know, generated by uh, Steve Zarlenga, who wrote the, uh, the rather large tome called The Lost Science of Money. Uh, and uh, uh, the alliance uh, was 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 uh, uh, born as an effort to uh, uh, go beyond the think tank stage and try to do things, and um, and try to get uh, the ideas of sovereign money uh, out into the public uh, sector to uh, uh, to address the kind of changes that are needed, and. I think that people in public banking are already fully aware of the problems of the current banking system. So there's nothing that needs to be really said ab about that. But what, what is important, I think, uh, that uh, a point that has come out here is that uh, the, the, uh, the problem of dealing with sovereign money on a national level is a difficult one because it's not an easy topic to get across. And it doesn't lend itself to, to, to short kinds of things on social media or, 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 or the like. Uh, so we do have an enormous problem uh, in terms of how to, uh, to, how to bring people in uh, to, to, to the effort. And also we have a problem in the fact there's no local aspect of it. It's all really at the federal level that we, 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 we are acting. And of course, people are more likely to get involved with things at local levels that they can more easily relate to, as you described, as Debbie, you described in terms of the California uh, public banking uh, efforts. So, uh, and one of the things I think that I think Debbie, uh, you pointed out that that is uh, is uh, something that we've been struggling with in the alliance, and that is, uh, we realize that uh, you know, like many organizations, we want to invite people to come into us, but really, what we have to do is we have to go out to other organizations. I think you've made that clear. And I think that's a point that we have to realize is a take home lesson. We have to take this message out. We can't expect others to come to us in order to, to, uh, uh, to, to bring this message forward. And I think we have to, uh, we have to reach out to a number of organ types of organizations in doing that, that share our, our larger goals. Uh, and also, uh, I think uh, public banking is particularly relevant simply because it focuses on the money system, uh, which the Sierra Club doesn't, even though you share some of their, their, their goals and these kinds of things. So uh, in any case, uh, uh, what the Alliance is trying to do is to uh, do education and bringing people into the understanding of how the money system works. And that, I think, <clears throat> we have absolutely in common with, uh, with the public banking uh, community. Um, and so it provides an opportunity. And so there are some in, in the Alliance who have looked at, 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 at public banking as sort of a distraction from what we're trying to do. But we've not everybody in the Alliance believes that. We're struggling with that issue. Uh, and uh, so uh, this, this interaction today, I think has been very helpful to, uh, to, to all of us. And I certainly want to thank you for, uh, uh, for being with us tonight. Thank you, John. I'm going to jump in here because I think it's worth point. Like uh, Susan brought up the Occupy movement uh, and, you know, John, uh, you know, I met you and I, I now know I met Timothy uh, through the movement uh, for Move to Amend. And I think right. that I, I want to take a moment to really underscore that. Like, you know, uh, like I bet everybody here has heard the phrase corporate personhood, right? And I see a lot of heads nodding uh, on the screen. So, and I'm not trying to be uh, arrogant or egotistical when I say I'm one of 50 people in this country that is responsible for you knowing the phrase corporate personhood. Uh, and I think this is illustrative of something that I think the Alliance for Just Money has got to grapple with because that is the shorthand 
that me and Richard Grossman and Jane Ann Morris and a whole host of other people came to to struggle with how to take the concept idea of a corporation is an artificial entity that is created by a statutory construction and an exercise of the sovereign power of the state government to create an entity in order to do uh, certain things in action and that a constitution uh, and that a constitutional right is the protection of the inherent and alienable rights of agency for which the, the subject of the political expression and process should never be infringed upon. That's uh, everything I just said is absolutely fucking true and it's not a very good bumper sticker, <laughs> right? Like, like the, the, and what we got to was, okay, a corporation is not a person with inherent inalienable constitutional rights. And that, so when the court creates the concept of corporate personhood, it allows corporate lawyers to overturn democratically enacted laws, right? So in other words, you can't say everything at once. The mo and, and move to amend is an effort to amend the US constitution. It's even harder to do than what y'all are trying to do at the Alliance for Just Money, because y'all are trying to do federal legislation, right? Like literally you can, like if you got Congress to act, you could do it. We've got, and a move to amend was an entire amendment to the entire freaking constitution. And where we landed was we had to get down to simple understand, like we had to force ourselves to, to, to get down to, not to say everything at once, but to have a set of frequently asked questions so that there could be a way to start the conversation and just take people wherever they are. I have found personally engaging folks from the, the sovereign money movement, engaging in conversation feels like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. Y'all just inundate me with power and force and so many different things that I end up saying, ya basta. Okay, ne never mind. It's like, I'll find another place to get a drink. Uh, and I, so I offer this as, a, as an ally, as a friend. Uh, like, I think that that's something that y'all could work on. And then the second thing, John, like learn from the move to amend approach, which was, well, although we're trying to amend the constitution, we could work on local campaigns for resolutions of support at the city or county level uh, and, and that provided us a concrete action that people could work on locally to advance the larger national movement. Uh, Debbie, did you want to react to this before we go to John Conroy's question in the chat? I don't know if I want to react, but I do have a question since this is supposed to be the part that goes the other way. David, you said at the very beginning that there was some tension between this group and modern monetary theory. And I have not done my research and I don't understand that tension, but I will say that I think Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth is really approachable. And I, I read it, I got a lot out of it. I came out understanding more than I went in. Um, she said in the afterward that her editor made her take out all the charts and graphs. And I'm kind of appreciative, I'm an editor myself. I'm kind of appreciative of her editor. I wanted to see the charts and graphs when I was done, but I wonder what this group thinks of that book and how different her approach is from what you all are trying to do. Well, um, I think a number of us would, uh, would respond to that. Uh, I, I too have read The Deficit Myth uh, and uh, the problems that she outlines and uh, the ultimate goals, uh, we share a lot of common uh, common ground with. Uh, what uh, uh, what we would say is that uh, that uh, although you have described, David has described uh, public banking as a non-reformist reform, we would describe um, uh, the uh, uh, um, modern monetary theory as essentially not a reform at all. Uh, it just says, keep on spending and go out to debt and don't change anything. It's, it's, it's not, it, it's, not it, it, it's a denial of the problems rather than a tackling of the problems. And I think, I think public banking 
is an approach to tackling problems. And we're trying it uh, at, at this national level, which is a bigger challenge as David has outlined. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we simply feel that uh, the uh, MMT uh, is, 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 is uh, simply not addressing, not a, well, it's addressing part of the problems in the sense that it's allowing expenditures, but in doing so, it's essentially laying the foundation for continued problems because we don't address this fundamental problem of debt that's, that's built into the debt money system. So uh, that's, it. Uh, I'm sure uh, Paul may want to speak to this, others may want to speak to this as well. So let me stop there. Thanks so much, John, that's very helpful. Um, did anybody else get into the stack or wants to pose a question about the, uh, the alliance and our system or, or back to uh, public banking? If not, I'll just say I'll just say two things about MMT. I, I did a little summarizing of Joseph Huber's work on MMT. He's a German professor who is the most incisive, uh, and this will because I'm saying so. We'll get into the study stack, um, but to encapsulate it really, really shortly, uh, there is a fatal analytic error in MMT and a fatal policy error in MMT. The analytic error is, is that they think that um, a sovereign state can just create money and not be holden back by taxes. Their motto is um, uh, taxes do not fund spending. And we profoundly disagree with that position. Uh, their policy fatal error is they're not reforming anything about the existing monetary system itself. They, they'll just leave it intact. They think that just the spending will do the trick and that somehow, you know, you can just manage the, the, the fatal flaws of the current banking system. So that's my, my you know, very short take on, the, on, the, on two fatal flaws with MNT, which you can understand we, you know, we really have a problem with. Um, anybody else wants to weigh in on MMT or do more promotion or explanation about the Alliance or get back about public uh, banking? I might want to make a few comments if I, if I All right, could. Paul, go ahead. It, I'll just let folks know, uh, I, I'll stay on for another couple of minutes, but, but I'm going to have to leave, uh, but I will uh, leave you in Debbie's capable hands. Okay, well, one of my comments. Oh, David, that's too, that's too bad. Uh, uh, it is. <laughs> thank you, David. Uh, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much uh, for your energy and your inputs. And, and uh, we'll, we'll stay in contact, you know, about the study stack, of course. Um, say hi to Mel. <laughs> and uh, no, th thank you so much. Uh, very much appreciated. Yes, yes. And we hope we can continue this conversation. Um, later because I think your insights are right on. Um, uh, a couple of things. Um, I wanna say that I think you understanding that the public banking movement understands money and, and monetary reform, it'll really help your message. I've heard some things tonight that I'm, I'm basically not going to respond to that were kind of right but wrong enough to uh, be misleading. And um, I would just suggest that you, you know, take a look at our site and you know, any questions you have, um, you'll understand banking. In fact, we often say that if you come from the banking industry, you probably don't understand what banking really is. And uh, we have one member on our board who actually did come from the banking industry and she happened to discover by accident what was actually going on in the banking computer, uh, the banking computer system and how money was actually created. And most bankers do not understand that. There's a lot of legalese and uh, you know, um, finance talk uh, that they understand. But um, I'm telling you, if you understand money, it'll make it so much easier for you to make your case. 
on the in the flip side, we really have to come up with a good hook, as David said. It's very difficult. Uh, you have the advantage that everybody hates banks. I mean, it's it's uh, visceral. Uh, people do not understand money, and it's a very very difficult concept for us to get across in a soundbite. So. Um, hoping that you could provide some insights to help us because it's a thing that we constantly struggle with. So that's all I have to say. I, I, will, go, I will go further into your site and I will ask questions, but I'll say we do understand as, as a group of activists, we do understand that banks create money. And I believe we understand how banks create money. And it is in fact, one of the pillars of our argument is this is why we need public banks. I feel like I'm often quoting Susan Harmon who um, spoke up in the chat earlier and who has taught me a great deal. Um, we need banks and not revolving loan funds. We need, we need banks and not credit unions because we need the advantages of fractional reserve lending in, in the existing system of, of debt. And if we can transform to a system of assets that will be obviously a thousand times better. But even in the existing system, I think we do have an understanding of the basic points that you're trying to make, and we disseminate that understanding wherever we can. If I could just say, Debbie, I think it's banks create what we use as money. That's fair. Yeah, that, they're not fair. creating money. They're it, creating. That's fair, and it might be, it, it might be a better framing. Thank you, Lucille. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I am going to have to, to go. Thank you uh, to the Alliance for Just Money for starting this conversation. I want to especially thank Bo Young, who helped to facilitate uh, this, and uh, Mark, uh, but also uh, just a reminder that, you know, I got to know many of you through that uh, democracy convention back in, I think it was 2017, uh, and just let y'all know that uh, the Liberty Tree Foundation for the Democratic Revolution is imagining trying to relaunch that effort. Uh, and it would be wonderful to have the Alliance for Just Money participate again whenever we do that. Uh, and especially for those of you on the East Coast, it looks like Boston, Massachusetts is where we would be convening in uh, space and time. So we'll be in touch. And again, I hope Debbie, you can stay through this conversation a little bit I can, longer. I can stay until six uh, Perfect. and I'll be happy to do so. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bo Young or Paul, do you want to uh, sort of direct, or Mark, do you want to direct this somewhere? Or does anyone have any questions? Is there anyone else on the stack, Hobart? Uh, no, nobody is on the stack, but but I, I do know that uh, that Ben has good insights uh, here, uh, and I like to uh, get him and, on uh, again. And I see Michael Diamond. Yeah raising his hand so mm -hmm. let's give him first the words and then if ben is on we'll we'll give it to him uh michael go ahead okay am i uh, unmuted you... yep yes i i was i was very uh proud and uh to have heard from howard Switz schweitzer he called me and asked me to participate in this meeting uh, more to learn uh, than anything else. Um, he, he was in touch with me because I, I, I had an article published in um, the Covert Action magazine. The title of the article is Ending Corporate Tyranny. Ending Corporate Tyranny. It was published on February the 18th. Um, the, the thrust of the article is that I've been researching a way in which the United States Constitution can be used to strictly control all, all of the corporate tyrannies, which include banking. banking. Um, I, I would love to make a presentation about, about this, but it would be inappropriate to do so tonight, 
because tonight's meeting was devoted to David and Debbie's presentations, and it would be fairer and more and and, and more well done if if a if the committee of this organization could read my article and determine whether they think that it has some bearing on their work. And if the answer to that question is yes, I would be honored to make a presentation to whatever group you would want me to talk to. But the, the, the purpose of my research is that, is that, is that this, this manner of control, I mean strict control, constitutional control, war powers control over corporations is conceivable by virtue of the domestic violence clause in Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution. Uh, Michael, is, is that article uh, publicly available on the- I just put it on the chat, Covert. Covert magazine. Uh, Covert, I put it on the chat. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, they misspelled my name in that magazine, you know, that's, oh. that's <laughs> bad. <but laughs> Uh, I will put that in, in the stack and we will uh, take your uh, offer there. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people who like to talk, of course, in our uh, uh, conversations here. Um, but it sounds fascinating. And, it, you know, the scope might be uh, uh, not US only, but global. Um, and I'm interested in that too. Uh, so, yes. Um, leave me your contact uh, uh, address one way or another. Uh, and I can uh, uh, get in contact with you. I, I can do it um, easily. It, it's my name, Michael Diamond, at Comcast.net. No problem. Got it. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. My pleasure. We have Luciano uh, waving his hand. Did you want to say something? No, no, just hello. Um, oh. Happy. <laughs> good, good day. Okay. That, uh, I, I, I have a question. Um, in Argentina, there are public banks, no? And they are very important banks. And I wanted to know if you both, no? Uh, are in contact uh, with them here. Uh, just a curiosity, no? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you have a, a, a network. Uh, and this network uh, arrives to Argentina. That's all, I, I, because I'm from Argentina. Sorry, it's a question. We're not in as much contact. Um, I would say that the American public bank movement talks most to the German Sparkasse network. Um, in the East Bay, we've had two speakers, one for a big public event and one for a small private event from Sparkasa, come talk to us. But one of the things we're doing, which I kept meaning to get around to mentioning, so thanks for the opportunity, is um, we are creating what we call the, uh, the California Public Bankers Association, which at this point is a pretty aspirational organization because there are no California public banks, but we're trying to build a network of professionals who are interested in being part of public banking and who can develop the skills necessary. And one of the things I hope that organization will do is build a much larger international network with Argentina, with Costa Rica, with India, with Vietnam, build, build the um, existing relationship with Germany I, I think I said at the beginning that roughly 25 to 30 percent of the world's money is in public banks and much can be done to work with that and we have not yet done enough. Oh, okay, many thanks. Uh, Mary Sanderson, I see your question in the chat. I don't have that reference handy, but I know where to get it. And I can send it on to Bo Young and uh, the other people I've been in touch with and have, have them pass it on to the organization. Sure. I'm, I will put that in the study stack also. Unless, unless Susan has it handy, which she might. I do not. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I wanted to call on Ben, but, but, but he, uh, he left already, uh, unfortunately. 
Uh, uh, Lucille, Lucille is on the stack. Lucille is on the stack. Okay, yes, Lucille. Thanks, Boyan. Um, and now I lost my trail. Um, I think there were two things I wanted to say. Um, one is that, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I lost it. So I'll go to the second. Um, I think that just as much as we, and maybe this is the first thing that, um, you know, I really appreciate David challenging us to say, think about taking a stand on public banking and make a decision about that. And I think um, uh, we should think about that. And I think many people here are um, in favor of it and familiar with it. And as I said, you know, I'm also in this little book club reading the web of, of debt. Um, so we're invested in, in a common cause. Um, I'm married to a German, I'm familiar with Sparkasa and their, you know, it's a long history um, and it's a significant sector of the German banking system. Um, but I think um, that the one comment, you know, maybe it was a little glib that I made in the chat and it wasn't glib though about Jubilee is that in, in a debt credit based money system, it is necessary for not just for ethical reasons, but for the survival of that system itself. And it's more in the mode of philanthropy that we have you know, going on now, um, but that is all like the largesse of an extractive system. And um, it, it's not, only human ethical that's a problem, but it's the environmental ethical so that the growth imperative that David is concerned about, public bankers are, we are, is built into the system that we have. And that, that is sort of what, what we wanna change. And so the second thing is also, if it's accurate that public banking advocates um, get the money system and are supportive of just money reform or sovereign money reform, then it would behoove the public bankers also to, to advocate for just money reform, that it's not that achieving public banking is not, doesn't eliminate the need for or preclude the um, sharing of that work and public banking people might not be working on sovereign money reform, but if they're supportive of it, they, they would also in turn endorse, um, you know, those of us who, who are working on that. Um, so that would be an invitation. And I, I think I did want to say something else, but I guess it's, it's been a long day starting with prepping for the book club at nine o'clock in the morning. And I want to commend Jawad Zahid, who's here from Bangladesh. And he was there this morning <laughs> at the end of, I think, his yesterday. <laughs> and he's now at the morning of his tomorrow, which we all have yet to get to. And he and some of the rest of us who are here, like Judy um, Young, were at both ends of this day together on a Alliance for Just Money Zoom call. So that's cool, Jawad. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Lucille, I think that's a very that's a very fair call to action. And I think it's a lot of why we're here is yeah. to figure out how we can help each other. I want to bring up a couple of books, maybe for the study stack. Y'all are read I got I picked up David's Y'all in just two hours. It's not my language. You are reading Ellen Brown's Web of Debt, which is a very important book. She also has a more recent book called The Public Banking Solution that is perhaps more directly applicable to here and now. I want to make sure just people know about that. And then because Lucille brought up um, philanthropy. Um, which is such an important issue. I am a huge advocate of Anandjira Haridas's Winners Take All, um, which is a real uh, thoughtful and also searing examination of the philanthropy system 
and who it's for. And the answer is it's not for the people who get the money. It's an absolutely brilliant book. Um, it's not really about either public banking or just money, but if we're gonna talk about philanthropy, I am obligated to recommend it. Um, and we're coming close to time. So I wonder if there's some way to just sort of wrap this up. Uh, we will try. Yeah, we got four minutes. It's, uh, I must say we had a really nice pace in this discussion and, and covered a lot and had some pretty good good insights and, and sharings here. At this moment, I just want to, uh, to repeat, uh, you know, some little basics uh, for our coffee house. Um, anybody here, uh, I invite you also for in two weeks. Uh, for a coffee house uh, with Yuli Korch. Uh, Yuli Korch is a longtime monetary reform activist, and he has put together some pretty big conferences in the past. In 2013, in Philadelphia, uh, in Switzerland, and in Germany, he has been active. And he just came out with a book um, that I'm going to promote here. I'm, I'm in the middle of it, and it's very profound and very good. And it's called Oh, here, the next money crash and a reconstruction blueprint. So it's basically an analysis of how bad our system is and what possible ways we have, specifically monetary reform or sovereign monetary reform, uh, how we can change it. And, and one of the uh, key, uh, it's an anthology. And one of the key contributors is again, Joseph Huber, who's not only an expert on MMT, but he is like the European or worldwide expert on monetary reform. So we will have Julie Korch, uh, the editor and also co-writer of this book, uh, talking about that book. And this will be um, March 22nd. And it will be uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time, 7 p.m. Uh, Central time. We will send you invitations again. If anybody is not on our uh, uh, newsletter list. I asked Carly to put the maybe a link in the chat so people can sign up for that uh, because that will be the way to keep informed about our activities. And then again, as I said, April 26, we will have uh, uh, Mark Castle, who is actually the professor of our intern, uh, Ben Benjamin. Um, and he happens to be uh, an expert and he wrote about uh, the Sparkasse system in, in Germany. So I think everybody who is interested in public banking will, will enjoy this uh, uh, presentation and, and make a connection with this professor. I don't know if he ever got on your um, radar, Debbie, uh, but if not, uh, you know, in a month and a half, um, <laughs> you, mm. you, can, you can have him. Be great. Um, otherwise, um, what other household items do I have? Not, not many. Otherwise, I ask Bo Young or Mark or Paul to add anything that should be known. And if not, uh, we can close it. I just want to say that I hope this is the start of something. Because, <laughs> um, uh, like I said, I think this has been very insightful. And um, I think we have quite a bit in common. And, and we really com our movements really complement each other. So I'm looking forward to, uh, again, as I said, to continuing to communicate with you and uh, kind of hash these things out. That's great. I, I, I just want to thank the uh, AFJM for having us and for being such an, uh, what, what do I want to say, such an engaged and informed and challenging, challenging in the best ways. Good trouble, audience. <laughs> and I think we can close it there. Thank you very much, Debbie. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Everybody good night, can everyone. unmute and say goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Debbie. That was don't, great. Don't close it yet. Don't close yet. I still have to get the chat uh, copied. <laughs> We got it. I'm saving it too. Chat copies automatically if you're recording. Yeah. Uh, that's well, you know, I'm one of those old guy. Gotcha. Not very... <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. 
Uh, Joseph, sorry, we didn't get to your uh, uh, stack question. No problem. Uh, I think we really got lucky there with Timothy being there as well. And uh, uh, yeah, that was very the, incisive. The, the other gentleman, um, um, Aaron, was it or er Earl? Earl. Earl. Yeah. He was yeah. also really good. Yeah, Earl that was, Stalin. That was really. And Mr. Diamond too. I'm I'm very much uh, looking yes. forward to that. And uh, I I put a link in there. He also did a YouTube interview. I think. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's an interview with Mr. Diamond, or yes. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, excellent. Yeah. And I, we got an international team again because we had Luciano from Argentina joining us, cool. which I very much <laughs> appreciate. Thanks. Um, now, guys, we will all see you again uh, in, in in two weeks uh, about the uh, Yuli Courts book, uh, which were pretty good. Uh, Yuli is a great guy; he's very engaging. Um, right. Can I, can I just ask Earl and Timothy a question? Yeah, uh, go ahead. We can hang I, on a little. I'm, I'm the host <laughs> now, so you know I have eaten already, so I don't have to run away. Uh, you know the both the um, public money and the uh, monetary reform movements are really a way of reducing economic rent and giving it back to the public, right? Um, uh, Mariana Mazzucato calls it uh, wealth extraction experience. And maybe that is what Michael has in mind in part with his tyranny. And um, Michael Hudson, I think, feels the same way. And, and they both also look at um, land value tax, particularly Michael Hudson, where um, uh, we, we, you know, that there's a huge amount of maybe the most wealth extraction takes place there um, in land inflation. And I wonder if either Timothy or Earl see some connection with um, public uh, banking and monetary reform and the land value tax approach. Um, is there, uh, we, Timothy pointed out how public money and monetary reform are connected. Is there also a connection to those two things to land value tax? Uh, I would recommend that you look up the work of an old economist named Henry George, right, <laughs> uh, who uh, made that front and center of his, uh, and he was basically the uh, robber barons who were then ascendant, uh, created the Chicago School of Economics and uh, put the Georges, who were otherwise quite influential, uh, out of business and down the tubes. Uh, there's a great account of the subversion of the economics profession that can be found in an unlikely place. It's a book on uh, uh, the steady state economy uh, by, I'm trying to remember his name right now, Ryan Check, I believe his name is. And uh, so this, uh, it's a, uh, the book is quite long, but it has one of the best uh, summaries or overviews of uh, how economics, the economics profession became what it is today at least in the United States, uh, that I've seen anywhere. Uh, You're still recording? <laughs> so it's, it's, not a, it's not a place where you would find it, but Brian Check has a, you go to steadystate.org, you'll find out more about him and his book. Uh, and I would recommend if you want to understand uh, how we got to be where we are, there, that book has a, about half that book is on that subject. And uh, it's really very eye-opening. <laughs> We also have a member, Dan Sullivan, and, and uh, this is his specialty. And he's he's given a, a lecture. I think that he he may I even gave a coffee house. I'm not sure if we actually recorded that or not, but that's his passion. So yeah, not not only his passion. He's like the head of the Henry George organizations in America. There's like mm -hmm. a alliance of Henry George organizations, and then Sullivan is uh, you know kind of director. Um, of that. Yeah, uh, are we still recording? Who is recording? Otherwise I'm still recording. Stop. Can we stop? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. stop. Just stop, stop so we can say whatever we like.